morning, Sonoma Valley Community Church family and friends. So glad to be here this morning. So glad to worship God here at 181 Chase Street in Sonoma, California. We're here to give God all the glory, and we want to welcome all those who are coming to us, either live streaming or who are going to watch us a, a little later. We want to... Uh, Welcome all the people of our church and to say we love you on behalf of the leadership of this church and on behalf of Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad to be married to my wife 34 years and counting. So it's, it's going well that way. And uh, obviously she needs to be the one to say that. But, uh, we're here. All is good. Amen. So uh, I want to thank Pastor... Tim Arnsmeyer for uh, stepping in this last weekend. Thank you so much for doing a great job. Thank you, Jan, for reading the scripture. Thank you to Pastor Alejandro for handling the technical side of things and Tim Martin for uh, handling the worship. Let's take a moment to pray, shall we? Lord God, we thank you for your goodness in the land of the living. We thank you, Lord God, that, we, that all things work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling as well as with confidence and truth and love. We pray, Lord God, that you would do a special work in this service that everyone who participates one way or another might feel blessed and experience the presence of God. Lord, we pray that you would break down every word, feed every heart, and that you would inhabit the praises of your people. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord God, for the authority that you extend to us to say no even to evil. Mm -hmm. And we pray, Lord God, that you would help us in this challenging day and age to find your strength to find your goodness working its way out in our speech, in our behavior, in our thoughtfulness towards others. Lord God, we pray that you would receive the glory here at Sonoma Valley Community Church and that you would work out your blessing through this church into the lives of the people of Sonoma and the people of Sonoma County, and the people of this world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a song in one of our older hymnals that is actually feels very contemporary, and it's called Come, Now is the Time to Worship. And so we're going to sing that song together, as well as a number of others, to give God the glory. Would you join us, please? time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. One of the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your Just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God, one day every knee will bow, 
Still the greatest treasure remains for those gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your God. Come, come. There is a hymn that reminds us that our hope is in Christ. And it's an old but good hymn for us to be remembering that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Olga? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on High and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On sides the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered. Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way He then is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. There's a 1970 song that I remember as I was just becoming a Christian. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you, loving you, serving you. It's really true, the greatest thing. And next to that, my wife. <laughs>
want to love you more. I want to love you more. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. I want to serve you more. I want to serve serving you. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of that is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. There is none like you. Lord God, there is none like you. There is none like you who knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that you know our times, that nothing that is taking place in this world surprises you. Lord God, we come before you humbly to say that we want to worship you, almighty God. We want to let go of the things that hold us back to give you true worship. Lord God, you are so worthy of our praises of our acclamations, of our thanksgiving, and of our praises of gratefulness. O oh Lord God, you even listen to our laments. You even listen to our pain. And Lord God, you heal us. You heal us by way of something we would never anticipate. In Scripture, in Isaiah, we read that by his stripes we are healed. 
Lord God, when we have pain, Lord, help us to identify with you who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Lord God, we don't want to stay in pain. We want to have a joyful song in our mouths, a song of praise to our living God. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to be empathetic, compassionate, listening to those around us. Lord, help us to share burdens and to care for one another and to put our cares upon your shoulders because you care for us and you comfort us with the comfort that you have demonstrated to millions and millions of people through the ages. We pray, Lord God, that Sonoma Valley Community Church would be a place of prayer, a house of prayer for all nations. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord God, that it might be a place where we reach out to men and women, to seniors mm -hmm. and to children, to boys and girls with your love. Lord, we thank you that we can be part of working through Samaritan's Purse. Lord God, we pray that you would help us learn more, contribute more, mm -hmm. and give more of ourselves to you mm -hmm. in all the ways we can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'd like to invite Patricia Wagner to come forward. Patricia has been sharing about Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child, and we're excited about trying to put together over 100 boxes this year for Christmas for children that will go out all over the world. And uh, Patricia, I know you have your notes. I know you have a lot of ideas, and you're very precise, and you've been sharing for the last couple of weeks. And I'm so proud that you're leading it. But I want to ask you a question. What does it mean to you personally to be involved with Samaritan's Purse? Okay, thank you, Pastor Henrik. Welcome back. Thank you. For me, it's the excitement of knowing you're bringing joy to another child, um, especially all over the world, um, to reach out to these young kids. Um, these young kids, they're not raised like we are. Um, they are in poverty. These kids that we give gifts to between ages 2 and 14, it's many times it's the first present they've ever received. And it's so much joy uh, that they have. And, and also the joy is extended because they learn about Jesus Christ. They learn about God. And so that was kind of my segue into what I wanted to say today. I don't know, telepathy maybe. This morning I was reading stories about the children who had received uh, these um, shoe boxes. And as I said, many times it's the first present they've ever received and they are so excited and surprised. There was a young girl from Bulgaria that received one and she still remembers the beanbag juggling gift uh, toy that she received. She couldn't read the, the English, but she could see from the diagram how to juggle. And she still has that toy today. And years later, she writes, the shoebox gift I received as a child was like a seed. It wasn't just a Christmas present. It made me feel special and loved by God. And then there's a 13-year-old th girl from the Philippines who received the shoebox. And um, her, her mom and dad lived, I don't know why they lived near a dump. Maybe it was after the father had a job, and then he left the job. He got fired, I think, and he left the family. And they were living by a dump. Um, and she remembers the horrendous smell. And when the shoeboxes came, she remembered she was handing out the shoeboxes to all the kids. And she remembers smelling them because they smelled such a different smell. And when she got her gift, there was uh, um, the fresh smell of uh, soap. And it really um, 
touched her. And she writes, I accepted Jesus into my heart, and I felt that through the shoebox he showed me the void in my heart had been replaced with love. It was a gift from him. Then there's a story from a young man in South Africa. He was raised by his mom and dad until he was, um, this, the boy was five years old, his father died. The mother left him with his grandmother and she, he didn't see her again. The, but the grandmother knew God and, and attended church with the boy and he learned about God. And then his grandmother died when the boy was 11. And that was the same year he received, received the shoebox. And his friends were saying, oh, that's, that's just lucky. That's just coincidence. He says, no, no. He says, I was chosen, and I'm blessed. And he also states, that's the difference between the ones who have seen the light of God and one who has not. And then the fourth story is a girl from the, the, the Middle East. And she received her toys with, with the, all the items. And the one thing she still carries with her is a photograph of the couple that prepared the box and sent the box with their blessings. And on the back of the photo wrote, may God protect and watch over you is our prayer. And she still keeps that photograph with her today. Um, and she's a grown woman now. So from these stories, I'm struck by how a small gift as a shoebox can cement the love of Jesus Christ and God to, to these children. They carry these memories with them forever. We are the lucky ones. We have the ability to spread this joy and the love of God through the simple means of a shoebox. Thank you, Patricia. Let's give her a hand. Well, um, there's a lot of things we can spread these days. We can spread love. We can spread the kingdom of God. And we can also choose not to spread COVID by wearing a mask. Our church uh, is wearing masks everywhere except right up here at this moment. And uh, I just want to encourage you because we have HEPA filters. We are, uh, in, uh, we are cleaning the church before people arrive. And uh, this is a safe place. And I want to encourage you to send that message out to everybody that church is a safe place. And that uh, we haven't had a single person who's been a part of this church um, catch covid and we want, to, uh, we want to recognize that there have been people that we know who have received it. And there was one person who just started attending. And then she caught COVID. And she was gone for a month or so to uh, quarantine. And so there are people in our lives who we know and care about. And we want to be praying for people to stay healthy and for people who recover to recover with all the strength and all the mobility and all the faculty that they can possibly have. We also want to pray for all those in our church who are recovering from surgery. I know that there's two in particular that are still recovering from surgery. And uh, we want to ask for God's mercy upon us as we give our gifts to him here at this church and also as we uh, fellowship outside after the service. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and grace. Lord God, help us to stay healthy. Help us to stay safe. Help us to keep one another healthy and safe. And Lord God, we pray that you would work not only through Samaritan's Purse, but also through our relationships. Lord God, it's so important that we not be afraid to keep relationships, to keep friendships, to keep 
ourselves in the truth and love of God. We pray, Lord God, that you would honor the gifts we bring to you to this day. And thank you that you've promised to turn our treasures on earth into treasures in heaven. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us with all that is within us to be the hands, to be the feet, to be the smile, to be the love that people need this day. Lord God, help us to put aside our own issues. Help us to forgive one another. Help us to, to uh, be released from things that we hold on to so that we can be all that you've called us to be with the days that we have left. Lord God, we thank you for this church. We thank you that this is a place where we can worship and come to you with all the issues of our lives. Lord, help us to hear your voice now as we worship you by hearing your word and by learning from you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite Jan Arnsmeyer to come forward and to read the word of God for us. This is 2 John 1, verses 1 through 13. The elder to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister who is chosen by God send your greetings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jan. The title of our time together, the time, this time in this message is called Spiritual Encouragement. It could be argued that every sermon, every message going out from a church this day is about spiritual encouragement. But what makes this in particular interesting, compelling, and powerful is that it is the shortest book in the Bible. The shortest by quite a little bit. Second John is just 13 verses. Now there may be some books in the Bible that have fewer words, but not fewer verses. And what we find here this morning is that this little letter has a lot packed into it. You know, when we write each other these days, we tend to text, and it has gotten so small that just a few words or just a few letters like LOL, which I think means laugh out loud. And it can mean other things too, in other contexts, I guess. But that we, we're down to just letters, little letters for communicating with each other. Interestingly enough, God knows how to be short when he wants to communicate just as much as he wants to be long. Do you know what the longest book in the Bible is? It's Psalm 119. And 
That has a lot of verses in it. This one, just 13, can take a long time to go through if you really dig into the Greek, if you really dig in to all the thoughts that are behind it. We're not able to tackle everything about these 13 verses this morning, but we can say that there is something powerful about this little letter tucked in between 1 John and 3 John and also part of a bigger corpus by John the Apostle, the beloved disciple, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Do you remember what he wrote? He wrote the Gospel of John, which is just such a powerful gospel. And then he wrote the first letter of John, the second letter of John, the third letter of John, and then the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is still speaking to our times today. And so is this little book of spiritual encouragement. He writes it to the lady chosen by God and to her children. Who is that? Well, it seems to be code for a church and all those who attend there. It may also be that there was a specific woman to whom this letter was written. There are times when we think that God's only about men. It's not true. Here's a letter written just to a lady, a chosen lady, a lady chosen by God. Boy, we can camp on that quite a while. A lady, a woman chosen by God. There's a lot of women who are chosen by God. They're chosen by God to be a blessing. They're chosen by God to be leaders. They're chosen by God to carry the grace, the goodness, the mercy, the wisdom, and the truth of God to a world that needs so much. Thank God for choosing women. Thank God for choosing ladies, ladies, the chosen lady. I think that when I think of lady, I think of the Middle Ages when there was this phrase, my lady, my lady. You know, you can see some of these movies or, or series where, where there are women who are given a certain title. We don't tend to give women titles as much as maybe we used to a long time ago. But in this case, in this context, John, the elder, the disciple whom Jesus loved, writes with great authority, but also great compassion and sensitivity and clarity to a woman who's part of a congregation that needs to hear personal, spiritual encouragement. Second and third John are both very short. Both letters are roughly equal of equal length, containing 245 and 219 words respectively, and each follow the tradition of the time of writing short private letters on a single papyrus sheet of standard size. Why are these letters short? Because they wanted to keep the letter on one side of one piece of paper. These letters are both personal with introductions and conclusions and share some common references to the theme of truth and love. And to the writer who is the elder writing with a tone of a father of the faith and to ongoing opposition to the once delivered faith by Jesus Christ. They also both seem to be written about the same time, somewhere around 85 AD. This is quite some time after Jesus had lived and died on the cross. Together with 1 John and the Gospel of John, they establish a timeline of development in John the Apostle's life as well as the life of the church circles around his activity while he was alive. First comes the gospel, and then the three letters, much later in time, that reflect the shape of the church long after Christ has ministered in the flesh. They are echoes of the gospel, and you can see words and phrases from the gospel of John reflected again, repeating again in these letters. 
focused on walking in the truth and light of God's Son, Jesus. The emphasis is on the nature of Jesus in relation to God and man, and the importance of right behavior as well as right belief in the Christian life. Some people think you don't need to believe the right things. You can believe whatever you want, or you can do whatever you want. But that is not the witness of 2 John, or 1 John, or 3 John, or the Gospel of John. Ultimately, we are to strive also for ongoing unity among the churches, because all of this glorifies God and fulfills the commandment to make disciples of all nations, a commandment which Jesus gave at the end of his earthly life. Now, second, the second letter introduces us to this unique and kind of code word recipient for a person or a church in some location distant enough to merit a brief letter. This is not a letter going to somebody who's just next door. This is a letter that's going out quite a distance because somebody needed to carry the letter to that church. The key thought here seems to be also that generations are chosen to receive spiritual encouragement. Notice with me, it's not only to the lady chosen by God, but also to her children. It's a letter to this esteemed woman and her kids, to this church and all those in the circle of that church. So it's going to be read out loud again and again. And it puts the children on the same level as the mom. Both are receiving from God spiritual encouragement. And there's an emphasis on what keeps them on, a, on the same footing. It is the indwelling of God's truth and love in their lives. That is what makes them chosen of God. Chosen to receive a letter that comes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and that made it into the Bible. What a gift! What an incredible gift to get a letter from God. To receive guidance from the living God in writing from the disciple whom Jesus loved about the survival of Christian faith among you and your people. Just 13 verses, but full of power, full of wisdom, full of strength. 13 verses to let you know that God loves you. He knows your address. He knows what's going on in your life. And he wants to encourage you with the grace of God. I don't get the sense that this was a large church that John was writing to, but it was a church on God's heart and mind. And it made it to the pen of the apostle. It seems that the battle for truth about God was not only conceptual, but personal. It lives in specific people. And it proves itself in their spirits and souls and behaviors. And it will do so forever because God is on the side of truth and love. Do you believe that? That God is on the side of truth and love? And more importantly, do you believe that God's love wins? God's love wins. That's what this letter is all about. There is no place in Christian life for denial of truth for suppression of truth or the twisting of truth into lies about Jesus or lies about the person of God and his purposes and words. It is the truth that establishes a basis for Christian love. I'm reminded of this French philosopher, Blaise Pascal, who I studied when I was doing my degree in philosophy as a young man. And Blaise Pascal was a very important mathematician and physicist. But he was also a philosopher, and he also became a Christian. And he wrote a document called Pensies, where he talked about the wager of whether it was wiser and riskier to not be a Christian versus wiser and riskier to, to be a Christian. Pascal's wager. 
This man is known in the history of philosophy and mathematics and, and physics as the guy who started the whole area of probability, who looked at, at mathematics in new ways that we are still basing our thinking upon to this day. And here's what he wrote many, many years ago. He said, truth is so obscure in these times and falsehood so established that unless we love the truth, we cannot know it. Now, doesn't that put a little tingle on the back of your neck to think that we might be living in a time where the truth is obscure and falsehood so established that unless we love the truth, we'll never find it. And that's what John is writing her about and writing that church about. That we need to love the truth of God. We need to love truth. And as Augustine so aptly put it, all truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth. We don't have to be afraid of the truth, as Christians especially, because all truth comes from God. And he's writing through John, the disciple, to this woman to remind her and to remind them and to remind their, their young people that truth and love are the basis of our relationship with God. What does it mean to be a genuine follower of, follower of Jesus Christ and yet to deny that God's truth is all, all truth is God's truth? I can't even conceive of it. If a Christian is willing to lie about truth in a simple matter, how can he believe the truth about Jesus Christ and about God himself? It just doesn't seem to work out. Logically, it is a denial of our own hope in God when we're in denial about proven truth in other matters. It is a wrong mentality to think that you can have lies on one hand and truth on the other and hold them together. No, as Christians, we hold to the truth and we say no to the lies. This is the basis of our rationality as human beings. God help us to be people who love truth and truly love as God loves. So the apostle continues his greeting by writing his hope-filled blessing that grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be ours in truth and love. And he puts God the Father and his Son Jesus on equal footing as well as the source of all we really need from God as we live our lives in truth and love. And when he writes the church about what is real, and then he writes the church about what's really on his mind. 2 John 1, 4-6. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. Those are the ones he happens to know. He doesn't know them all. Just as the Father commanded us, and now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. If you hear nothing else from John the Apostle, as the final word we will ever hear from him, it is simply three words. Walk in love. Walk in love. And what is love? It's not a feeling for him. It's not some notion of, of being overwhelmed by endorphins. It's, it's all about doing what God has called us to do. Doing what God has called to do, us to do. When he writes to the church, he begins his message on the nature of spiritual life in the local community and the dangers that are rising outside of it as well. He starts to paint a picture 
of the great contrast between truth and error and between wisdom and foolishness. And in verse 6, he says this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. And so it begs the question, what commandments, what does that mean? How do we walk in love? How do we walk in truth? And so he begins to help us think that through. Love is the practical outworking of truth from God and about God. And the connection between truth and love in God's economy is God's command that we engage in love as Jesus loved people. Look to Jesus to see how that works out. By telling them the truth and telling them the truth in a way that spoke God's love into their hearts and minds. If you want to know what love and truth look like when they kiss each other, look to the life of Jesus. He was never afraid to tell the truth, but he always told it in love. He was never afraid to love people, but he always did it in truth. Wherever we are located in our relationships with family and friends and neighbors, it seems clear that we should express truth and love in ways that help them to come to a, a greater experience of God's love and truth themselves. God wants us to respond to the needs that other people have, but not to get them dependent on us. He wants us to give of the goods that we have, maybe even as far as the shirt on our backs, but not to give them so much that they don't keep going on the way that God has called them to, and they get trapped by what we are doing for them. So the loving thing to do, like the Good Samaritan, is to go and help the person on the side of the road. And then, having taken care of them for a while, let them keep going. So the loving thing for us, as we listen to how Jesus operated, is to listen to God's wisdom about the people around us. Are we listening for God's wisdom regarding the people around us. I know that's not easy. Some people seem to have a great knack for it. And some of those people we call saints. I'm not a saint. I am a pastor. And I try. But it's not always easy to hear God's wisdom for other people. One time, many years ago, we just gotten married. Shard and I were going to go to New Zealand for an internship that I needed to be a part of. And before we went to New Zealand, I told my wife that her dad was going to die. I said, go make your peace with your dad because you won't see him again. And she was just reminding me of this this morning. Two weeks later, he passed away. It was as if God had woken me up in my spirit to tell my wife something I didn't want to tell her. But she never forgot that God had spoken to her those short little words that then allowed her to go and say the things she needed to say to her dad before he passed away. Her dad had a calendar of all the days ahead that he was going to mark until we were back from the internship. He planned to make those X's go all the way through the several months we were going to be gone. He never got past 12. You know, that's the way life is. But it's not, it's not a normal thing for God to speak to your spirit ahead of time. And so God is speaking to you sometimes on behalf of others. You can't control it, but my gosh, we can tune in sometimes and we can hear it. What is God saying to you about other people? God wants us to love them with ways that enhance their dignity and release them into God's presence rather than capture them for our own selfish purposes. I recently had a car problem fixed by a mechanic, and it took like a week 
for my car to be fixed. And then when I arrived home, I got a couple things together and I wanted to get in the car and I wanted to drive and just 30 minutes after picking up my car, it would not start. It wouldn't start. I couldn't believe it. I called my mechanic, Paul, and he sent his prime mechanic over to, to look at my car. It was not the batteries. It was not a light left on. The starter had gone out. The starter had gone out and needed to be replaced. But his act of kindness to come out and check the car after he had just worked on it showed me the Christian heart of Paul, the owner and mechanic. He's a man of honor. He stands behind his work. He guarantees all that he does, knowing that failure in a car could have major consequences and that God is watching. He's an honest businessman in all that he does, from all that I can tell, and I'm blessed to know him. Do you have that type of reputation for truth and honesty and love that my cant mechanic has? John the Apostle would say that it's the glue that holds churches together, living in the truth and in love. If that is not the case, churches and their witness will fall apart in a world where lies and hatred abound. Those that live without truth and love live without honor, and they will face the living God one day. John, the apostle, the disciple, launches into five verses about deceivers, about the other side of love and truth. He says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. John wants to talk to us about how to handle the problem of deceivers who do not hold to God's truth nor love in their lives. They are of the tribe that discount the humanity of Jesus so that they can live without account to God. They want to emphasize their own intelligence as their own priest of salvation through secret knowledge so that they may receive the benefits of people looking to them for answers to the problems of life. The Gnostics, as they were called, were some of the earliest heretics to infiltrate the church with their poisonous doctrines. Arising shortly after the gospel began penetrating the Roman world in the first century. The word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Philosophy means the love of wisdom. And they mixed things up. They believed when Jesus came to earth, he didn't possess a body like our own. Instead, the Gnostics taught that he only seemed to have a physical body, known as the heresy of docetism, from the Greek verb to seem. This was a denial of the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation, the belief that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. But the Gnostics went even further. They also denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus, an event Paul argued must have taken place or our faith is in vain. Let me just put it simply. If you get Jesus wrong, it's all wrong. You can't miss that Jesus is both human 100% and God 100%. This is our faith. And John is saying, look, there are deceivers who will speak against Jesus. They're not afraid to do so. And those people live in our day and age as well. I'm not a Christian. I'm a man of science. I only believe in what I can see, feel, touch, and all. And I want you to come to me as a doctor 
and let me take care of you. I don't believe in God, but I do believe that you can pay me to be your doctor. There's a lot of malpractice going on these days. And John wants to remind us all in verse 8 to protect ourselves to protect ourselves so that we do not lose what we have worked for or the rewards that come along the way. He wants to remind people about the connection between Christ's teachings and continuing to possess both the Father and the Son. We're to draw a clear line between entertaining Christ and his people and entertaining deceivers who seek to obscure the truth and teachings of God for their own gain. So why be so black and white about this? Simply because truth matters. Because all truth is God's truth and spiritual encouragement and spiritual guidance from God are precious gifts in our lives. It's not by accident that God's truth and love encourage our hearts, our souls, our minds. In Jesus, we have the very word of God, the most personal direct, and meaningful communication God could ever give us. Look at that. In Jesus, we have the very word of God, the most personal, direct, and meaningful communication God could ever give us. If we're wrong about Jesus, then it's a slap in the face to God because Jesus is God's son. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that we, by grace we have been saved through faith. And that is not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. God has lots of good works for us. And that can't happen if Jesus is just a ghost or a spirit to contemplate. He needs to be fully human and fully divine to help us work out our salvation in fear and trembling in this life and the next so that our sins, which are many, have been truly put away and so that his power raises us to new eternal life bodily. God promises a new body for us. He promises resurrection for us. And that promise is based on a demonstration of God's Holy Spirit raising Jesus from the dead on the third day. You may be aware of this picture that is so famous. It's the Last Supper, and it was completed by Leonardo da Vinci in 1498. The Last Supper is a 15th century mural painting that is located in a convent of Santa Maria in Milan, Italy. It is one of the Western world's most recognizable paintings. Leonardo's work is assumed to have been started about five years earlier in, 45, in 95 and commissioned as part of a plan of renovations to the church and its convent buildings. The painting represents the scene of the Last Supper of Jesus with his apostles as it, is, as it is told in the Gospel of John 13.21. Leonardo has depicted the consternation that occurred among the twelve apostles when Jesus announced that one of them would betray him. All twelve apostles have different reactions to the news with varying degrees of anger and shock. And I want you to notice something. Here is Judas, and he's reaching out, he's reaching out his hand to grab bread, and Jesus is reaching out to grab a different bread. And interestingly enough, in all other paintings of the Last Supper, Judas is not part of the picture in the foreground. We have sets of three for all the disciples. And there's Jesus in the middle. And Leonardo, by the brilliance of perspective, has, his, has Jesus' eyes going to the bread. This is The face of Jesus is the vanishing spot for everything else in this picture. There's all sorts of dynamic and wisdom going on 
in how Leonardo painted this. But for me, I am reminded that even Jesus had somebody at his table ready to betray him. So John the Apostle is saying, look, don't let the church fall apart through deception. Don't let the church fall apart by not holding strong to truth and love. And so this morning, I want to ask us, are we holding strong to the truth and love of God? John does not give us a big description of what deceivers are like. He gives us an even better picture of what God is like. God is all about truth and love. And it's not weakness, it's strength. It's strength to live in truth and in love. John the Apostle, like Leonardo, is drawing our attention back to Jesus, who himself was betrayed and away from deceivers. How do we know the truth and whom to trust? Well, the church is the place. It's meant to be the place where people gather for God's, God's guidance and encouragement to sort out the great issues of their lives in the presence of God and one another. We are called to help each other live in truth and love. And that call is never more important than during a pandemic when people need God's truth and people need God's love. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning with our aches and pains, our concerns, as well as our devotion and all that we have of strength. And Lord God, we ask you humbly to help us live in truth and live in love. The two watchwords of personal spiritual encouragement that come from the pen of the disciple whom Jesus loved. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to find ways to extend spiritual encouragement to those around us and help us walk in truth and love. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to have a stand, and I'd like to close with this song, The Lord's Prayer. Bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. And may you walk in the truth and love and grace and mercy 
of Jesus Christ. And until we meet again, may you go with joy in your heart that God is with you and will never leave you or forsake you. In Christ's name, amen.